kind introduction, you know, the, I should also add uh, uh, a mention of my co-presenter here, Richie Lee. He's with NASA Ames Research Center. Due to the time difference, he's actually going to appear by video. And that's going to happen a little bit into the presentation today. So today I'll be uh, talking about AI and trustworthiness. And I uh, have a little bit of uh, you know, reflections on that initially in the talk. Uh, but then I'll jump um, pretty quickly into two case studies, uh, one with uh, soil moisture modeling and forecasting, and the second case study on adaptive stress testing in aerospace. And I hope that these two case studies are uh, illustrating some you know, dimensions of um, trust in AI. And then we'll uh, conclude with um, uh, some, uh, some final remarks as well as the Q&A. So this uh, topic of trustworthiness in AI has uh, received a fair amount of attention recently. And here's one example of that. It's with the European Union. And they've released uh, a number of documents. This was one I found interesting, which illustrates um, or, or lists seven different requirements for achieving, you know, ultimately trustworthy AI. And without going into too much detail, we see here human agency and oversight technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination, fairness, social and environmental well-being, and finally, accountability. You have here also uh, the Aviation Safety Agency of, of the European Union. Um, a nice document called uh, Level 1 AI Assistance to the Human. And again, uh, we see here that uh, they're um, you know, covering a lot of ground, but they have identified a few AI trustworthiness building blocks, which includes trustworthiness analysis, learning assurance, explainability, and safety risk mitigation. So uh, to wrap up this uh, mini discussion of AI and trustworthiness, we see that uh, these complex and trustworthy computing systems with AI becoming more and more uh, prominent in the discussions about AI. Um, we have, of course, also various XAI programs and uh, projects uh, both in the US and in Europe, include, including in Norway. Um, but uh, we also note that there's a lot of different dimensions to this uh, AI and trustworthiness discussion. So in order to, to uh, get into some level of detail here, I'm going to focus on two different things. Um, one I call AI ops, just to keep it uh, very simple and have a little bit of a tag on that. The other one I'm going to call, call AI dev. Um, the first one is, we have a complex computing system, uh, which is using AI, uh, and probably with other computational methods and, and computing um, software as well. And um, here, I have one case study, which is soil moisture modeling and forecasting interpretability and transparency are important dimensions there. Uh, then the second uh, type of system that I'm interested in is the development of trustworthy complex computing systems using AI, and here the AI is used during development of a complex engineered system. And here I have this second case study, um, adaptive stress testing in aerospace where Richie will be, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about it, but the Richie will be the main uh, presenter here. So without any further ado, I'll jump in to uh, the first case study. <clears throat> And uh, of course, we have also some papers on this topic, and uh, I'm showing them here very briefly. I don't want to take all the credit for this uh, for this work. Um, it's uh, among others with uh, my former PhD student Anuruddha Basak and a uh, very uh, prominent collaborator at the U.S. Geological Survey, Kevin Schmidt. So here's the story. Uh, in sort of a nutshell, <clears throat> we have uh, 
forest fires potentially all over the world um, and the western us they're quite important they occur quite often and uh, what happens then as a result after the forest fire well, of course the forest fires are important and and uh, dangerous in themselves but then after the fire uh, there might be rainfall <clears throat> and as a result of the rainfall there might be um, landslides or debris flow as it's also known as and we see the result of that or at least one example of a result over here on the right hand side where a house is almost uh, completely covered <clears throat> at least up to the roof line uh, with uh, with mud or debris um, as a as a result of this process that's illustrated here okay so the uh, what we're interested in then is to try to generate early warnings of debris flow and uh, studying the soil moisture and uh, as well as rainfall is quite important as part of that. So our research question here is, with the rainfall forecast and current soil moisture measurements, can we estimate or, or forecast future soil moisture? We want to do it accurately in a data-driven and interpretable way. Note that, as you may imagine, <clears throat> this type of soil, if after rain, after, sorry, after, after uh, forest fire, but before rainfall, is quite uh, a delicate thing. And it's quite important and difficult to, to model this type of soil. We also re realize that soil moisture is important in other settings. And there are also other interesting and important complex uh, time series forecasting problems out there. But let's go back to the soil here. Um, we want to develop a hydrological model to express soil moisture as a function of rainfall and time. We have identified these three requirements as important, should be data driven, so we can use current sensor technology and machine learning. It should give accurate predictions in the medium term, five to 24 hours, and it should be interpretable and understandable, especially to earth scientists. And we want to use rainfall forecasts and current soil water content to predict future soil moisture conditions. <clears throat> Sampling can take place in different ways. I'm not going to pay too much attention to that here to keep things a little bit uh, simple. And uh, of course, you know, modeling soil moisture has been uh, a topic that's been studied uh, for quite a while. We took as a starting point this uh, antecedent water index model, or that's what we also call the simple exponential model. And it's listed here. <clears throat> um, I don't want you to, to drill too much into this model, but you may want to think about what happens with this delta T here. You see there's a delta T here and here. As it tends to zero, you will see that what happens then is MST equals MST minus one. In other words, current level of soil moisture is exactly or, or tends to the previous level of soil moisture. And then um, this first term here, it models the recession of soil moisture after rain ceases. So how does the soil moisture drop as, as it's, it's uh, a time since uh, rain? And the second term here models the increase in soil moisture from the rainfall. That's the idea with this, this formula here. And there's some constants here. And in particular, we noticed this decay constant, drainage coefficient Kd. So what you've done is that we have introduced this more complex model where uh, we have more constants that we are estimating from data and we have different types of recession of water after the rain and we also have a more complex model of how rain impacts uh, the soil moisture and i don't want to get, go into too much detail here but uh, it's basically uh, the two, two different constants here is a 
suction gradient that's augmenting the gravitational redistribution. And then there's redistribution that's dominated by gravity. And we see those two constants here. These two things were not separated in the previous simpler model that I showed on the previous slide. And you know, why, you know, why do we want to introduce this model here? <clears throat> what we noticed was that this very simple uh, SEM model, it worked quite well when it was trained at shallow depth, so five centimeter in our case, but not at the deeper levels. Because at the deeper levels, the simple exponential curves that we saw here uh, on, the, on the two slides back was just too simple. And uh, we noticed that this model, it just seemed incomplete and, and uh, too few, having too few parameters. And therefore we are introducing this more complex model. And um, at the same time, we don't wanna make it so complex. So uh, we don't wanna make a black box model that's, that's hard to understand for the user of the model. Okay, let's uh, drill a little bit more into it here. And here's sort of the overview of what we, uh, what we did and why we think this is an interesting approach. We have the data, you see the, the burn, a part of the burn area over here. So we have a data-driven approach. <clears throat> we then subsampled and smoothed the soil, the soil moisture data. <clears throat> we trained our models. We used it to predict future soil conditions. We wanted those predictions to be accurate. We also looked at the parameters. Uh, after all, you know, we were, we were claiming that this model is interpretable. So we want to make sure that the parameters in the model uh, make sense to the earth scientist. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the soil moisture and rainfall measurements first. Um, here's an example of what the burn area looks like. Here is a little hole in the ground that the, uh, our earth scientist dug after, after the fire and put these sensors in. And um, uh, this is actually from back in 2007 in Southern California in the Santa Monica Mountains. And uh, these types of, of hill slopes can be quite uh, dangerous or they can lead to, to landslides even after a quite light rain. Um, uh, the measurements of soil moisture here were done using this uh, uh, Dikigon probe. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that. And uh, here's an example of the uh, data that's collected. Fire took place. We have the soil moisture sensors that were installed as I showed on the previous slide. And we have here, the blue line is the, uh, the rainfall. And here, the, um, I guess we can call it pink. The pink line shows the uh, soil moisture at 15 centimeter down in the ground. Then we have the yellow line, that's the deepest one. And then you have the blue line, which is uh, closer to the surface at five centimeters. And we see that uh, you know, the, the deeper into the ground uh, we get, we have less of this uh, diurnal variation. So um, you know, this data set one can study for quite a while. I'm, I'm just gonna introduce it here to you and hope that you're interested in, in taking a closer look. Um, and we see here, there's, there comes a little bit of rain. There's a reaction to that, actually quite dramatic reaction. And then comes more rain. And uh, the reaction to that, as far as soil moisture, is compared to this, not as, as great. So this is not a homogeneous situation here. The conditions are changing quite dramatically over time. So it's, it's again, it's a complex, uh, difficult situation to model. Okay, let's talk a little bit about subsampling and smoothing the moisture data. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say that uh, that was part of the package here. And I refer you to this paper uh, if you're interested in that topic. Let's talk about the training. <clears throat> Here's what you did. We fitted these models to the data by minimizing the mean square error objective function defined over the parameters. Here's an example of what that looked like. And uh, this is for the very simplest model um, to measure the quality or to validate 
uh, we split the data sets into training and test sets, we fit the models in the training set, measure prediction in the test set. It's a standard machine learning uh, for uh, temporal data. And we made sure that both the training and the test set consist of major storm or rainfall events. We use differential evolution and uh, uh, with uh, good success. Don't want to spend too much time here, but um, just to say that we are we use different types of of uh, algorithms, and uh, we found that this differential evolution or DE approach was the best performing one uh, along overall and uh, certainly along most dimensions. Yeah. We looked at standard error, maximum absolute error, and training time. Okay, let's briefly look at predicting future soil conditions. Um, so why are we interested in this? Well, um, these destructive debris flows, they can be quite uh, dangerous. Uh, we show here another house. I showed the house previously. And we see here, uh, uh, this is from 2018. So this is more recently. And uh, these things are probably only going to get worse with climate change. Uh, here there were 21 deaths um, and many buildings destroyed and also led to quite dramatic uh, impact on the uh, on the uh, road network in the area. So what we think would be useful is predictions that are performed and available some five to 24 hours ahead of time so that you can improve safety and reduce damage. So I'm just gonna show here very quickly a comparison between different types of models, R models here, NIR and AR, the same model that I showed, and also some models from the literature RMAX. See here that um, in the beginning, uh, the difference is quite small. Uh, but we're more interested in this, what we call the medium term. And uh, we see that in particular, this AER model that we introduced is, is much more stable and has, doesn't seem see this uh, quite poor performance in especially the maximum error as the um, time horizon. So the forecast horizon increases. So if you want, let's say, a forecast 15 hours ahead of time, um, here's the performance of our AER model. Here's the performance of the SEM model. See that the AER model is uh, is quite uh, competitive. Um, okay, let's uh, briefly look at the model parameters and how they are understandable from the earth science perspective. <clears throat> As mentioned before, we have this this uh, formula that uh, is uh, describing. Uh, the soil moisture has really two parts. One part is for the drying. The other part is for the effect of rainfall. And um, when we use these models, we have, um, we estimate two parameters, Ks and Kg, which are, the, which is the suction gradient and the gravitational redistribution. And in this, um, in this wetting part, we have uh, the rainfall, we have this eta parameter that sort of uh, uh, moderates uh, the rainfall. And we also have this KW parameter, which is also uh, taking care of the impact of the rainfall and how it bumps up the uh, soil moisture. We also do a summation here, which wasn't part of the original uh, SEM model. And this is to take into consideration uh, a sort of a time interval around uh, the current rainfall and not only uh, a rainfall at a particular time point. Hopefully that gave you a flavor of what's going on. And now we, let's take a look at those constants that we are in, um, estimating from, from the data. You see here that this Ks and Kg are quite different across all different soil depths. So we think this justifies 
our choice of two different drawing terms in our model, the fact that they turned out to be so different. Also, a second point here is that the drying rates at the shallowest layer, five centimeter, is much higher compared to the deeper layers, reflecting solar radiation as well as atmospheric and vegetation regrowth. Um, and you see here is the, uh, the shallowest layer at five centimeter. Uh, here's the measurement at, uh, at the deeper layer. And we see that both of these uh, constants are smaller relative to the, uh, to the previous ones at a higher level. Okay, so let's wrap up here on explainable AI and neuroscience. Um, we modeled the soil moisture variation with time and rainfall. Um, again, this is a quite challenging data set. Um, our models are interpretable. Uh, they're consistent with their scientists' understanding of these processes in the soil. Um, we hope to extend these models in different ways, for instance, to uh, incorporate better the soil, soil moisture variation in, across different layers of the soil and uh, also um, improve by introducing other types of measurements. Okay, let me stop there on case study one. I think we'll hold off on questions and comments towards the very end. So let me just drill down into case study number two, adaptive stress testing in aerospace. Again, we have you know some papers here, and uh, uh, should really give uh, most of the credit to Richie Lee, who's been the main driver on uh, most of these uh, not all, but many of these papers. And uh, should also note that uh, this approach has been emphasized or has been used most in aerospace setting but has also been, uh, been uh, tested out in other, for other autonomous vehicles. Before we start the video with, uh, with Richie, I just want to give an overview of what's, uh, what's happening here with adaptive stress testing and sort of what the overall picture is. We have a simulation. We have aircraft. The, are approaching each other. And of course, there are many layers of safety in aerospace. Here we are assuming that those have failed and the aircraft are, as a matter of fact, headed towards each other, or at least they're in a, in a situation where there is likely for a collision or a near collision to happen, okay? So we have this, we're doing testing, and then Richie will talk about this adaptive stress testing approach where we are creating and studying different types of aircraft behavior on these challenging scenarios. So that's creating uh, these, uh, these scenarios that we show up here where we have um, collisions and we have no collisions. Um, then analysis of machine learning is done in order to classify or cluster these, these scenarios into different categories. When you run a simulation on many, many uh, scenarios, you get so much data, so much time series data, it's hard to handle it. So therefore we're interested in, in categorizing it. And then uh, we ask the question, are we done? Are we happy with the performance of our system? If not, then we move on. Uh, and take a second round of scenario-based testing using our simulation. When we're happy, we move on to the field testing and deployment phase. Hi, and thanks for being here. I am Richie Lee, a researcher at NASA Ames Research Center in the Robust Software Engineering Group, where we research algorithms and tools for assured autonomy. In this section, we'll talk about some of our tools and algorithms, including adaptive stress testing, differential adaptive stress testing, and grammar-based decision trees. And we'll talk about applying these tools to the safety validation of the FAA's Next Generation Aircraft Collision Avoidance System, also known as ACASX. 
Adaptive Stress Testing, or AST, is a safety validation approach for finding failure scenarios more efficiently. We created AST to address the following three major challenges in safety validation. First, the system under test can be very large with many lines of code, and it can exhibit arbitrarily complex behavior. The system can, for example, contain machine learning or reinforcement learning components, which generally don't have any safety guarantees. The state space can be high dimensional and continuously valued. Second, the system can interact with a large open environment, such as a busy airspace or airport. And moreover, the interaction between the system and the environment can be sequential, occurring over many time steps. Because failure scenarios are sequences, that is a sequence of actions and interactions leading up to a failure, search algorithms need to consider an exponential number of possible futures. Third, the safety critical systems can be extremely safe once they've reached a certain level of maturity in the development cycle. And this makes failures extremely rare and hard to reach. All of these challenges can easily make the search space intractably large and in general impossible to exhaustively cover. This motivates us to come up with intelligent optimization algorithms that can scale and more intelligently cover the space. We consider an adversarial safety validation framework. We are given a system to test, which is the system on the left side, and we assume the system is fixed. It interacts with an environment over a sequence of time steps. At each time step, it observes the environment, makes a decision, and then takes an action to affect the environment. The environment can contain anything that the system interacts with. For example, an aircraft collision avoidance system might have the aircraft, pilot, sensors, and weather in its environment. The environment also accepts another set of inputs, which are the disturbances. The disturbances are assumed to belong to some distribution P. For example, an aircraft application might have a wind disturbance based on a wind model. An autonomous car application might have distributions over how pedestrians move. In traditional Monte Carlo testing, one would simulate the system while repeatedly sampling disturbances from P. In our framework, we introduce an adversary that observes the environment and can directly choose values of disturbances that get passed into the environment. The adversary optimizes the disturbances so as to make the environment as challenging as possible for the system under test to try to make the system fail. The idea behind adaptive stress testing is to group the environment and system under test together into a simulator and pose the problem as a Markov decision process, or MDP. Then we can use reinforcement learning algorithms to optimize the MDP. In the MDP, the agent observes the state of the simulator and chooses a disturbance to apply to the environment. The agent repeatedly interacts with the simulator over a sequence of time steps, and through trial and error gradually gets better at choosing disturbances. The goal of adaptive stress testing is to discover the most likely failure scenarios of the system. We define the reward function of the MDP to achieve this. Mathematically, the ASD problem is framed as a constrained optimization problem, where the objective is to maximize the likelihood of the path subject to the constraint that a failure event occurs at the final time step. We define a failure event as a set of states E, and an event occurs if the simulator state is within this set. While our studies focus on failures, the event of interest does not necessarily have to be a failure or safety event. An event can be arbitrarily defined to be any subset of states. We assume that the simulator itself is deterministic and only the disturbances are stochastic. So transition likelihood is given by the likelihood of the disturbance x. The path likelihood is then given by the product of the likelihoods at each time step. Next, we convert the AST objective into a reward function that can be used for reinforcement learning. We craft a reward function with three terms. The first term gives a reward RE if the simulation terminates and a failure event occurs. The large positive reward incentivizes the agent to find a failure event. The second term gives a negative reward, negative D, if the simulation terminates but an event does not occur. The missed distance D is a heuristic distance measure that hints to the agent how close the simulation came to an event. The missed distance significantly speeds up the search by giving the agent additional information, helping the agent distinguish between two trajectories without events. The third term in the reward function gives the log likelihood for each intermediate step. We use the log likelihood here because reinforcement learning maximizes the sum of rewards 
whereas the AC objective maximizes the product of the likelihoods. In the JIR paper, we show that maximizing the reward function is equivalent to maximizing the AST objective. The Next Generation Airborne Collision Avoidance System, or ACASX, is an aircraft collision avoidance system being developed by the FAA to replace the current system, which is called TCAS. Aircraft collision avoidance systems are mandated on board passenger and cargo aircraft in the US and many countries around the world. The system monitors the airspace around the aircraft, and if two aircraft are predicted to get too close to each other, then the collision avoidance system will issue a resolution advisory, or RA, to the pilot. For example, telling the pilot to climb or descend at a certain vertical rate. The pilot then maneuvers the aircraft in response to the advisory. These resolution advisories are typically issued on the time frame of less than one minute to a potential collision. For a collision avoidance system, one of the key safety events is a near midair collision, or NMAC. NMACs are defined as two aircraft coming closer than 500 feet horizontally and 100 feet vertically. Even though ACASX and TCAS are extremely safe systems, it is generally accepted that the NMAC rate cannot be driven to zero due to sensor noise, pilot response delays, variations in the way pilots respond, and also to achieve reasonable operational performance. So the question we want to answer is, if failures do exist, what are the most likely scenarios that result in an NMAC? Following the AST framework, we created a medium fidelity mid-air encounter simulator that models the airspace, sensors, aircraft dynamics, and pilot response. As part of the ACASX verification and validation team, we obtained prototypes of the ACASX system and embedded them in our simulator. Because we were using the actual implementation, uh, failure scenarios that we find are directly relevant to the program. Intended pilot commands were given as the disturbances for the agent to optimize, and we seek to find scenarios of NMAC events. On the right side of the slide, we illustrate the three terms in the reward function for the ACASX application. If an NMAC occurs, then we get a large positive reward. If the encounter terminates and an NMAC does not occur, then we get the negative miss distance, which we use the distance of closest approach. For non-terminal steps, we get the log likelihood of the disturbances, which for our studies use the LLCEM pilot command model from Lincoln Lab. We used a modified Monte Carlo tree search with progressive widening for the optimization. We performed a number of studies, including single threat or two aircraft encounters, as well as multi-threat three aircraft encounters. AST worked very well at finding a variety of interesting failure scenarios, which we shared with the ACASX team. We found a number of very interesting categories of failures. One category, for example, involved the very tricky case where the aircraft would cross an altitude after the initial RA was issued, but before the pilot started to react to it. In the example shown here, aircraft one is initially above aircraft two when it receives a climb RA, but then crosses an altitude and ends up below aircraft two by the time the pilot starts responding. So the aircraft ends up climbing back into the other aircraft. Another category of failures involved aircraft turning at high rate in conjunction with vertical maneuvering at high rate. Perhaps one of our most important findings is the chart on the right on NMAC rate. We compared the performance of AST with direct Monte Carlo search and found that AST was able to find more and more failures with increasing computational budget, whereas direct Monte Carlo wasn't able to find any NMACs at the computational budgets we were considering. We also looked at multi-threat or three aircraft encounters and found a variety of categories of interesting scenarios, including one involving a tricky case with the coordination logic in cases where RAs between two aircraft led to a conflict with a third aircraft downstream. What's important to note here is that because we are using a simulation-based approach, adding more aircraft was simple because you only need to add it to the simulation. The AST part remains the same. Our AST studies discovered a variety of categories of interesting failure scenarios, and we shared these results with the ACASX team for their analysis to inform later iterations of the system. In 2018, ACASX was approved by the RTCA and became an international standard for airborne collision avoidance. Next, 
let's talk about an extension of AST called Differential Adaptive Stress Testing, or DAST. AST looks for failure scenarios in a system under test. In some applications, it might be useful to analyze failure scenarios of a system not by itself, but as compared to another baseline system. This might be useful in regression testing, for example, where you have a new version of a prototype and you want to compare it to an older version to see if you've introduced any new failure modes. Or maybe you have multiple release candidates and you want to pick the best one to deploy. It turns out that we can achieve this by running two simulators in parallel, one with the system under test and one with the baseline system, but both taking the same inputs. Then we again use AST to optimize, but this time we maximize the difference between the two systems. We want to drive the system under test toward a failure, but keep the baseline system away from one. We call this approach differential adaptive stress testing. The reward function for the differential case takes two sets of inputs, one set from SIM1 and one set from SIM2. It has the same general structure as regular adaptive stress testing. The reward function can be divided into three parts. The first two terms look at the terminal conditions of SIM1. If it terminates and an event occurs, then you get the big reward RE. If it doesn't, then you get penalized with the missed distance. The next two terms are the negations of the first two terms, but looking at SIM2 instead of SIM1. The negation is the key to driving the difference between the two simulations. And then the last term maximizes the transition likelihoods for both simulations simultaneously by adding the log transition likelihoods together. For the ACASX application, we're interested in comparing with TCAS. ACASX is the new system being developed, and TCAS is the existing system that's currently in operation. We want to find the scenarios where there is a difference in failure outcomes between ACASX and TCAS. We get results that look like the example uh, shown here. Top row is ACASX and bottom row is TCAS. Generally the same scenario, but the systems respond quite differently. They result in different outcomes where an NMAC occurs with ACASX, but doesn't occur with TCAS. We also looked at the reverse case with TCAS as the system under test, which is shown in the top row, and ACASX as the baseline, shown in the bottom row. And again, we were able to find a number of failure categories. Compared to the previous study, we found that differential adaptive stress testing was able to generate 39.3% more NMAX with TCAS than with ACASX. While not directly comparable, it is reassuring that this finding is qualitatively similar to results from other studies which use direct Monte Carlo sampling and also show a safety benefit of ACASX compared to TCAS. Next, I'd like to tell you about interpretable categorization and grammar-based decision tree, or GBDT. In the testing and validation of ACASX, we often generate large data sets of aircraft encounters. Some of these encounters have NMAX and some don't. To make these data sets useful, we want to help a human understand when and why NMAX occur so that the insights can flow back to help the development team improve the system. What properties do these NMAC encounters have that differentiate them from other encounters? There is a strong need to create automated tools for interpretable categorization. The term categorization here means both clustering and generating explanations for the cluster. For small datasets, you can have a domain expert manually analyze the encounters, but for large datasets, this becomes intractable. Second, High dimensional heterogeneous time series datasets are difficult to visualize and difficult for a human to analyze. Third, we want to have rapid iterative development cycles with many prototypes, so we don't want to have a slow, expensive manual process in the development loop. Next, interpretability is important for automated analysis tools because we want the tool to assist a domain expert to find patterns and for the domain expert to be able to understand and validate the results. We propose a grammar-based decision tree, or GBDT, which is a generalization of a traditional decision tree. Decision tree is probably one of the most intuitive models for humans. On the left, you have a traditional decision tree. The rules are either Boolean variables or thresholds. 
The simple form of rules can actually be quite restrictive and limits the expressiveness of the tree. For example, it can't handle time series data. What we propose is to generalize the rules to allow any expression that produces a Boolean result. The user specifies a grammar to constrain the space of possible expressions. The framework itself is very general. The uh, grammar can describe the syntax of any language. In this work, we use a grammar based on temporal logic to handle time series data. The grammar can be customized to suit the application domain. Decision trees are traditionally used as classifiers, so the GPDT can be used to classify whether an encounter will result in an NMAC or not. But the decision tree can also be used for categorization by considering each leaf node to be a separate category. So even amongst encounters with the same output class, we can group them according to which leaf node gave the classification. We can extract an explanation for each category by taking the conjunction of all the branching properties from the root to that leaf node. Training a GPDT follows that of a traditional decision tree by using top-down induction, learning the first rule at the root and then recursively splitting and learning rules in the child nodes. To find the best rule at each node, we use expression optimization. Expression optimization has three inputs, a grammar, which specifies the domain of the expressions, the data, and a cost function, which tells you how good an expression is. It is also common to include a regularization term to the cost function to encourage simple expressions. These go into an expression optimization algorithm, which can be, for example, genetic programming, uh, grammatical evolution, cross-entropy method, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And the output of the algorithm is the expression with the lowest cost, for example, um, the temporal logic rule that is shown on the slide. This is a fun example of a GBDT trained on the Australian Sign Language dataset from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. The data comes from volunteers wearing instrumented gloves and signing various words in Australian Sign Language. The dataset is a time series with 22 variables, uh, including bends for each finger, XYZ position relative to the chin, roll pitch yaw of each hand, times two for both hands. Here we extract eight words, same, different, hello, wrong, please, no, right, and yes. I'm showing pictures of me signing each word for reference. The images are not part of the data set. You can see that the GPDT learns a good decomposition for the data. It immediately separates out same and different from the other words by looking at whether the left pinky is curled or relaxed, and then uses whether the right palm is ever facing up to distinguish between same and different. On the right side, the right middle finger being straight is used for distinguishing hello, and then the right pinky being straight to pick out the word wrong, and then so on and so on. We applied GPDT to an ACASX dataset of 10,000 encounters. Each encounter has 77 variables collected at 1 hertz for 50 time steps. This is coming from aircraft simulation logs describing the state of the aircraft, sensor observations, input outputs of the collision avoidance system, etc. The dataset was heterogeneous in that it contained Boolean, categorical, and numerical variables, and the trajectories were labeled as NMAC or non-NMAC. We trained a GPDT on the data and extracted six NMAC categories, one from each NMAC leaf node. We show some examples from each category here in this visual overview. We found some very interesting categories. For example, category one highlighted a spike in the relative vertical rate, while category six highlighted an altitude crossing during the pilot response delay. And this is not something you have to guess. The logic rules that the algorithm finds directly points to what is the differentiating property for each category. In this last section, I'd like to tell you a bit about open source software packages for adaptive stress testing. If you're interested in trying out AST on your application, there are several open source implementations available. Adastress.jl is an AST package written in Julia, released by my team at NASA. It is currently going through the open source release process and will be coming out very soon. POMDP stress testing is another Julia package for AST. This one is written by students from the Stanford Intelligent Systems Lab. 
It is compatible with the pomdps.jl ecosystem of MDP and reinforcement learning solvers. Adaptive Stress Testing Toolbox is a Python open source package also coming out of Sizzle that plugs into the gym and garage ecosystems. I'm going to talk about adastress.jl because that is the one that I am most familiar with. But all of the AST software packages will have very similar interfaces and organizations. The main components are the system under test, a semi-stochastic environment, which has random variables that follow a known probability distribution, a definition of a failure event, and a definition of misdistance. We have two interfaces depending on how much information about the system is known. A black box interface that does not reveal environment variables or transition behavior, where the simulation is updated internally and interactions are only through the manipulation of random seeds. And then there's also the gray box interface that does make the environment distributions and variables available. The types of uh, solvers available depend on which interface is used. Gray box gives more information to the solver, so whenever possible, the gray box interface is preferred. I'll talk about the black box interface using the walk1d example, which describes a pond with position x being blown around by some random Gaussian wind, A. The position of the pawn at the next time step is the current position plus the disturbance, and a failure occurs if x exceeds some threshold x critical. The code for this simple example is shown on the right. Start by importing the Adistress library, then create a simulation object that inherits from adistress.blackbox. Then you have to override and implement several key functions in the interface. The reset function resets and initializes the simulation. The step function advances the simulation to the next time step. Notice that the stochastic disturbance in step is implicit in the black box case, and manipulation of the disturbance is through the global random seed. Three other functions are needed. Is terminal returns true if the simulation has ended? Is event returns true if a failure event occurred? and distance returns the missed distance. Defining the simulation interface functions is the bulk of the work. Now we create an AST MDP to wrap the simulator, then create a solver instance. In this case, we choose Monte Carlo Tree Search. And then we can call solve on the AST MDP. The gray box case is very similar in terms of interfacing. We're going to use the cart pole as an example, where we have an inverted pendulum on a moving cart with some pre-trained stabilizing controller. We, the adversarial agent, get to control the wind blowing on the pole, and a failure is defined as the pole falling over. Similar to the previous example, we, Im we import the add a stress library and create a simulation object. This time the simulation struct should inherit from uh, add a stress dot gray box instead. Just as before, we implement the reset, is terminal, is event, and misdistance functions. The part that is different is that the gray box simulator should implement an environment function that returns the disturbance distributions for the current state. This exposes the full distribution of possible disturbances that the solver can choose from to use as actions. You can see this in the step function, where we now have an additional input argument where a specific disturbance value is passed in. The gray box interface also requires an observe function that returns the observation or state of the simulation as a vector. The remaining steps are the same as before. We create an AST MDP from the simulation object, create an instance of the solver, which in this case is soft actor critic, and then we can call solve on the AST MDP. The solver returns the top trajectories with the best scores. Then we can plot the state trajectories of the failures, or for the cart pull case, we can also make these fun animations of the failures. Thank you very much, and I'll finish by leaving my contact information on the slide. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you.